I think we're live now. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the last webinar of um, the 2020 uh, webinars for the Brisbane French Festival. It's a very special one to close that series um, because today we will be talking about a, a fascinating subject. We'll be talking about the companions of duty, les compagnons du devoir. Um, when I first met Laurent and Toma at one of the French Australian Chamber of Commerce um, function, I was so impressed. I didn't even know we had some in Australia. So thank you very much for taking the time to explain what that is. Um, it's something so important that um, it's been like more than 800 years. I think you'll go through the whole history, but it's been many, many years since the medieval age that this exists. And especially uh, around Bastille Day, because during the French Revolution, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the compagnonage uh, was sanctioned by the government and they've been banned actually, which is the only time. So we'll hear all about uh, le compagnonage, your masterpieces and your personal journey. So um, I'm very happy today to welcome uh, Bertrand, Anthony, Laurent and Thomas. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm gonna just let probably Bertrand go through the presentation. Just one thing on the right hand side of your screen, we do have a chat button so you can ask any questions you'd like. I will ask all the questions at the end. Um, and we will also be going for a poll and a presentation. So Bertrand, all yours now, thank you. Merci, bonjour, uh, hello, bienvenue, welcome. Uh, to our last our webinar about the Companion du Devoir. Um, so today we are going to um, present you uh, what the Companion has, um, the history of the Companion, how uh, the we uh, study um, in France or, or trade, the different trade as well, how to identify the Companion and as well um, how we become ourselves. Um, Compagnon du Devoir, so we generally do a masterpiece, so we will uh, explain all our different master, uh, masterpieces. But uh, before that, we would like to know um, if you heard already about uh, Compagnon du Devoir, so we'll put a question that's going now live. If you can just, um, what you heard about the journeyman or Compagnon du Devoir? Yeah. So the poll is on the right hand side where the chat is. So we've already got um, some people entering. Um, there's a lot of yes. 50%, oh, only 50% have heard about it. 25 never did and 25 heard of the journeyman. Oh, of it. All right, so I think um, we have a, learned, a lot to learn from you. Okay, so uh, we're going quickly to present ourselves. So, uh, I'm Bertrand, um, I'm a compagnon pâtissier, so French pastry chef. And, um, and yeah, I did uh, my training so all in France, mainly in Germany, and then I came in Australia after, after that. Um, yeah, maybe Thomas, you can present yourself. Yep, so um, I'm Thomas. Um, I'm a uh, Lotus educator <coughs> and uh, I met uh, Laurent back in France like before to arrive in Australia and we met again here. Um, and I met Laurent, uh, Bertrand and uh, uh, Anthony here in Australia. And uh, actually I'm working for Modern Journey Wood and Metal based in uh, Byron Shire in Northern River. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, good afternoon, I'm Laurent. I'm a <coughs> maker, component of maker, which is translated in French as a uh, ebenist. Uh, we are working with wood, but it's mainly uh, about like furniture making, specialized in furniture making. And I'm business partner with, uh, with Thomas, who I met uh, during my tour of uh, France. And I met briefly uh, Anthony as well a few years back in France before we met again in Australia. Thank you, Anthony. So my name is Anthony, and um, I'm a companion um, joiner cabinet maker. Uh, same, I did my all my training in France, and I uh, I met briefly Laurent through my tour de France. Um, so. Um, 
I meet them again in Australia while I was doing a road trip uh, and swing by Byron Bay and had the chance to meet Thomas, Bertrand and Laurent who welcomed me in their homes while I was traveling. And then I'm currently living in Melbourne and working for a company called Grandville Architectural Construction, which is a um, low carbon company who try and build houses from scratch and um, using like as less carbon as we can. So that's pretty much it for now. <laughs> Thank you. And just giving you the results of the poll uh, for the audience today, 42% only of our attendees have heard about Compagnon and 42 have never heard and 14% uh, have heard of other journeymen. So here you go. Ex you have to explain everything now. <laughs> All right. So, um, so to, yeah, for about the history, the Compagnon, so legendary start from the... Um, uh, the slide is going on. Or not? Oh. Yeah, sorry. Just to make sure you get the slide, uh, so that we can present ourselves. Uh, yeah, so we're going to see. So um, this afternoon we're going to see. Uh, so oh, we present you the companion, uh, the study, uh, the different type of trades we have, uh, how to identify the companion, and as well um, our masterpiece. To become company ourselves. Not the time uh, So the history uh, tracks back uh, legendary uh, with Roi uh, Salomon, King Salomon, in, uh, uh, who was building uh, uh, his castle and his temple, sorry, a famous temple, temple back in 900 years before Christ. And uh, he asked for two companions to help him, so uh, Met uh, Jack and uh, Pierre Subis. And um, yeah, they, they went there to, uh, to help him building this, this famous uh, um, temple and went back after to, uh, to France. Then, where we can trace uh, the companionage is back to the Middle Age. So 12th century, uh, where we uh, they were building so cathedrals um, and yeah, um, so mainly was um, um, uh, building uh, with the mason, the carpenters. Um, yeah, we were developing that and we we're trading, uh, learning the trade by uh, going from one cathedral to another. That was uh, the companionage, pretty much uh, the origin. So now it's been changed a lot. Um, yeah. Was it stop? Yeah, it was a stop, pretty much. Yeah. All these days. Um, so it's Anthony. Anthony? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. No problem. So current, currently, the companionage has a unique and strict education system. Um, so to start the journey to become a companion, the first step is to complete like a two-year apprenticeship. Then uh, to start the Tour de France and go on the Tour de France um, with the approval of the companion elders, each student is then required to make an adoption piece for assessment. Um, to sort of a test. So if we pass this test, the student may start the, may start the Tour de France, then become known as an aspirant. Aspirant because we aspire to become a companion. Those um, aspirant years might take up to five years uh, to gain enough experience, travel and work prizes. And um, as doing that, we can learn different um, different techniques that can be in our trades. Um, then again, each aspirant, uh, they feel ready or after the five years, they must again ask the elders if they are technically in the process of making a masterpiece for final assessment. So there is no monetary exchange for tuition as a companions, uh, not for profit association. When companion complete the masterpieces, um, they are required to pay their skills forward to the next generation of aspirants 
by serving in a management or teaching role for two or three years within the association. Um, so I think um, we'll we'll talk about our masterpieces at the end of the of this webinar. Um, so this is not available in Australia in the trade sectors. So we basically what you can see now on the slide is basically an equivalent of um, what companion level might be uh, any Australian qualification framework. So this type of study, um, Australian traders achieve a certificate three to obtain their qualification. The level of training and in intellect companion achieve is equivalent to a master degree. And um, some Australians seeking further education can apply for grants like the Churchill Fellowship Program to learn these skills in Europe. If they are studying in France, there is a good chance their teacher are also companions. Um, I think we can move to the next slide. Yep. Um, that's, yes, yeah, study. As we're in travel at the same time as learning, which um, emulate similar experiences to their forefathers, they mostly stay in dedicated companion houses across France in campus style living, just like this one on the right. I'm not sure which one is it though. <laughs> in recent years, traveling overseas for one year is now part of the curriculum, which may require them to learn a second language to French, which is what the curriculum is delivered in. Family members and partners are not allowed to accompany, as, accompany sorry, as parents. This can make the balance between work and personal life difficult. Um, this immersive experience to make compared to a form of uh, military camp lifestyle. These factors in their demanding schedule can make graduation rate as low as 3%, which means that basically every everyone that is starting this um, study as an aspirant, there will be like between three and 5% of success, um, meaning that three or 5% of the one that started will finish based on uh, motivation, other factors. Um, I think, yeah, that's Thomas. Yeah. So I think the, the yeah. house in the future, uh, which has the, the, the house, is, the yes. company house in Rouen. Yeah, Rouen Normandy. Rouen Normandy. Yeah. And then the... um, cool. I wasn't sure. <laughs> where, I, where I did my masterpiece. Yes, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, study. So the study starts actually. Um, with uh, the apprenticeship for two years. And uh, the first year is very important for uh, a new student to learn um, how to use the hand tools properly. So the first year is just like um, uh, completely like based on using hand tools and not power tools uh, at all because um, it's, it's, it's really like through like all trades, uh, the most important thing to do first, to learn the right movement using a tool before using a power tool. The power tool is just there to go actually faster um, than, the, than the hand tool, but like the, the skill required um, is, is the same. So it's just like you, are, you have the good base when you start to, to learn. Uh, say. Um, so mostly like hard skills and soft skills, so it's the uh, association of like working working with your hands and but also uh, thinking about what you're doing so the association of your hand and uh, and the mind uh, as you can see on the slide there um, so there is three separate uh journeyman association gigs with uh within france um all of us here uh anthony laurent bertrand and i uh, we are from the Association Ouvrière des Compagnons du Devoir du Tour de France, AOCDTF. Um, and so this association is like, um, covers like uh, over 30 different trades uh, and divided into like uh, six different categories. As you can see, so you have a building, metallurgy and industry, layout and finish, taste, living, and soft materials. 
So starting with the uh, building category, so under building category, you will find blocks with Sinta fabricator, carpenter, plumber, roofer, brick mason, and stone mason, mostly. Um, so this is just to uh, uh, summarize the, um, uh, a bit like the, the trade under this, uh, this category. And it's the category where you will find the first stage of construction. Uh, for example, um, Luxemis and Meta and Metabet Fabricator, it's the trades uh, I've been playing in. Um, the thing is, when you hear about Luxemis, it's just because it's related to back uh, to the Middle Age, where like Luxemis was very important, like the, all the locks were made um, uh, by hand. Like today, this trade like evolved and pretty much like no locksmith metal fabricator made the, the, the lock, like you are fitting the lock into um, um, uh, an item like a door or a window. And so there is an evolution in all those trades of the, the middle age, obviously. And the metal fabricator, so locksmithing is like 5% of, um, of this trade. Uh, the rest is like metal fabricating, which is like around all related to access and safety. So uh, to be like door windows for access, staircase, um, and safety like the balustrade uh, and locks obviously because you need to lock a door. So it's, uh, it's part of the uh, safety. Um, yeah, so the picture you have on the slide is actually a stonemason that carving a scroll into um, a ground column. Well, it's an element of a ground column. And actually, carving it for you. Mm. Um, yeah. so, so we also have another thing. category? Yeah. 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 Um, so the layout and finish, uh, layout and finish category is uh, like more of a secondary stages of construction. Um, my trade, for example, is a joiner, and uh, I make a range of architectural fixture, pretty much like Thomas, but in wood. So doors, windows, stairs, and rail, balustrading. Um, for example, Laurent, we, who is a cabinet maker, um, we would be lo more like doing, um, or we would better known as a furniture maker, as he makes kitchen. Uh, cabinets, etc. But this this part of the trade is also included in um, in a joiner currently um, trade. So th those two trades are pretty much together now. Um, what you can see on the slide, um, the first picture is like typically um, two joiner working in a workshop, um, making probably doors or windows. And um, the second picture is a replica of a Louis the 14th style office cabinet. This was made by another companion. Um, I think we can move on the next slide. Yeah, so one of the um, uh, another category is like metallurgy and industry. And this category up here um, along like the um, uh, industrial revolution. So obviously it wasn't there like uh, uh, during the Middle Age. Uh, it's more like a risk. It's, yeah, all those trades under this category are like more what we, are, we know now. So um, maybe not blacksmith. Blacksmith. Blacksmith is linked to this category because uh, the blacksmith was known for making tools, um, not only tools but most tools for other trades. So. Um, in, in the category of metallurgy and industry, the blacksmith has actually its, it's, its place as well. Uh, and we have bodybuilder for um, uh, cars, uh, body cars, um, boiler makers, electrician, um, foundry and caster, machinist and mechanic. So all those trades uh, are really related like, uh, from the industrial uh, revolution. Um, and it's a very fast evolving category as well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things happening uh, and also like uh, trades tend to 
um, connect to each other. Like, uh, for example, locksmith today we have like a lot of locks that are electronic, and this is a part of the job of an electrician, for example. So uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of evolution between the trade and connection now. Um, the image you, uh, that you can see is um, two students working on the uh, aerodynamic Peugeot concept for a scooter. So the test, uh, so another uh, type of uh, section. So where we have the bakers, butchers, uh, cheesemakers, uh, cooper, so the people who do the barrel for the wine, uh, pastry chef and winemakers. Uh, this section um, of trades has been evolving a lot in the uh, company. So when I was doing my tour de France, only bakers and pastry chef um, were doing the tour de France. And now we have yeah, we have all these other um, uh, yeah, other trades that came came along and uh, and. Great, yeah, it's just great because they have as well the the, the face. Um, that's that's the things that are happening as well at the moment. So the compagnon are losing some some trades, but at the same time, new ones uh, appear and get their place in uh, in uh, yeah in to, to become compagnon as well. So and some it's trade, it's evolving. some trades really appear yeah. as well, like uh, yeah. during the um, uh, metallurgy and industry. We had like the foundry and castor, which was like uh, very important, like uh, very big, like uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, the industrial revolution. But now, uh, over the years, like this trail like went completely disappear practically, and now it, it's actually coming back. So um, it's interesting, very interesting to, uh, to see. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so then we get the um, category of the soft materials, uh, which includes the leather worker, the saddle upholsterers, the shoemakers, and the upholsterer. So fabrics and leather craft form this category, and they collaborate harmoniously with many other trades. Uh, many companions work in technical roles with some of the world's leading player or fashion houses, like Dior or Chanel. So yeah, this, uh, and this this trade they also like are also linked with other trades because we are we are working with leather workers to make furniture. We can um, same for um, probably for uh, for metal working as well. Just for some links with us, we are making like for example like to make curtains for the the bolsterer. They would make the curtains. They would make the rods. Yeah. Um, so all the all all trades basically are always like uh, connected. Um, at some point in, in, the, in the manufacturing stage. And for example, like the soft materials, like you say, leather worker, um, there, there is a lot of like uh, employment in the, in the industry and the uh, sector for uh, leather worker, like for uh, all the seats that are in cars or um, yeah. boats and the helicopters. Um, uh, it's it's pretty big. So soft materials, yeah, it's not only like, um, um, for example, like a big houses, fashion houses like Dior or Chanel, but it's also like a big part of the industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the living category, so it's a pretty small uh, category, this one, which uh, includes the fires, like me. Fires, yeah. Fires and landscape gardener. So it's pretty much like a more like a niche category than get to a flora and fauna. So it's It's still there. It's still there. It's surviving. And the landscape gardener, they are also like connected to the 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 as well. They are they are also like in the same. Trade corporation uh, and the lost trades. So evolution in trends and technology that seen some some courses discontinued. It has also brought about opportunities uh, to replace them with new trades. For example, the wheelwrights 
have been around for over 3,000 years making silver wheels for carts. And as motor vehicles became popularized, this one trade has been replaced with multiple trades in the automotive industry. So the, those trades are um, yeah, all can be like we just we just named a few of them as uh, like the rope makers, the weavers, the milliners, uh, the dyers, tailors, leather panels, and wheel rides. Um, yeah, so it's just like there are many more. Yeah, there are many more. There's just like uh, as the as the as the technology evolves and the needs uh, evolves as well. Um, some trades just are yeah. just, just disappearing, and unfortunately, and the, and the knowledge is also lost. So it's sad, but I think that's the whole thing. So the global recognition. So um, today, the the Compagnon du Devoir uh, the trading as a association. Uh, so it's association recognized. Um, uh, not for profits in France, and they as well been recognized by the UNESCO as um, uh, for the patrimony uh, under the in intangible cultural uh, heritage. So to safeguarding, safeguarding the program of their network for the transmission and knowledge and identities uh, for the professions. Um, the Compagnon de Devoir is one of the two education facilities in the world to achieve uh, this. Okay. Unfortunately, no aspect of the Australian culture has been uh, recognized and safeguarded under this. So, how to identify the Compagnon? Um, so, generally, we just handle people. Um, we have been taught. That the quality of our work speaks for uh, for itself, and that should always go first. So generally, we're not putting that upfront um, for yeah for business. It's not something that we put everywhere. Uh, being a companion doesn't give you exclusive rights to work in the world. That's um, illustrative job. Uh, whoever manager will be uh, confident that we are competent in carrying. Our technical uh, in France, it's, it's common um, knowledge within trades to not write company or qualification uh, in our resume. Uh, again, it's the quality of our work. Very much. Um, the other clue to identify uh, companions uh, could be um, so. It was more at the time where they were traveling, so uh, like a few centuries ago when they were traveling from one city to another. So now we do that with car or with plane when we were traveling um, in the world. But they used to have a, a tent. So you, you have a, we used to have a tent like this where we got as well um, at the handles, we got a different. Um, uh, we we got uh, square and compass. Uh, we got the um, uh, logo of our uh, trade because each trade got its own uh, logo. Uh, we have as well. Um, can go back on the slide, maybe a little bit. Um, yeah, and give you the the different details about the the name of the compagnon itself when it's been recognized, etc. And on the right side, you can see this moment. So when he's traveling, so this is at, um, so that was more uh, in the past. And we also have a um, um, velvet sash. A velvet sash. So that can give us, uh, that's more in between companions. So we can recognize generally we have that around uh, during manifest, uh, official manifestation and don't ceremony. Don't wear it. No, uh, it's just yeah, on special like, occasion, and yeah, it's depending on what has been on. Um, it can identify if you uh, where you are up to in the companionage. If you just a companion, if you just starting your for the phone. Yeah, the, the symbols on the, the different the symbols. symbols on the on the sash. Um, uh, can show through the way if, uh, if you are a, a companion, 
uh, or if you are still an actor, uh, depending on the number of, uh, of uh, symbols, it's just like steps in the progress of uh, the Tour de France for companions. Um, so yeah, there is, it's, it's mostly like between us doing uh, meetings, uh, talking about the companions and um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be where well, like for yeah. weddings, uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, but like, or, like just, just, just ceremonies. There's, yeah. there's different colors depending which uh, right. phrase you have. So, yeah. for example, yeah, the taste is generally a uh, gold one, gold color. So the, the red here is like uh, to identify the trade of um, uh, metallurgy in industry mostly. Uh, blue, it could be like all that uh, related to uh, wood. Related. Yeah. 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 And um, the whites, the whites for the uh, white the for stone mason, mason, um, yeah. Rupert yeah. as well. Yeah. And the green. Yeah, white is mainly people working outdoor. Sorry, Anthony. What white is mainly for people working outdoor that got like an outdoor trade, except carpenter because they're working with timber, but white is like roofer. Um, the, the, the really basic construction, um, which is plumbing, roofer, um, stone, uh, stone mason, stone cutter, mm. and mason, basically. Yeah, all the pretty much the trades that are relating to a work on site and not a work in the workshop. Mm. Uh, so one of the um, one of the symbol of the, the companion is the, the square and compass. Uh, it's important to note that the square and compass has also been identified as a symbol for the Freemason movement, which is an entirely separate group. So we are not Freemasons. Companions have been established in France in the 13th century, whereas the Freemasons were established in England during the 17th century and later extended into other parts of of Europe and the world. Uh, Companion guilds practice in professional, sorry, Companion guilds practice in professional products and services, which don't necessarily relate to masonry trades. Um, so in, on the, in the picture on the slide, so that's the picture I took actually, uh, that was uh, in the carpentry of the Cathedral of uh, Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, so this piece, probably doesn't exist anymore. Maybe they found it back, it's made of metal, so I hope they will find it back. So that's where they, uh, they extended the, the carpentry to have another tower at the back. Uh, so they made a modification in the carpentry and it explained who was in charge of the job, who was the architect, who was the, the carpenter in charge, what, what was the company, and you can see the logo of the, the, the square and compass uh, from, from, the, from the company. But mostly companions who are working on this uh, on this type of, of work uh, at the time. So our map to graduate from uh, aspirant companions, uh, individual must design and fabricate a masterpiece, what we call a masterpiece, uh, from their active trades. So we're going to go through that a bit later. Now. <laughs> so just after the just after this time. <laughs> All right. So in the city of Tours in uh, west of France, uh, there is a museum dedicated to preserving the historical tradition of the companions and the companionage. Most of the artifacts in the museum are masterpieces or exceptional pieces of work, as films, uh, made for for home. Uh, they take thousands of hours to complete. Some of them, some of them more. Uh, some are replicas of, of traditional antiquities, other are, uh, are modern concepts which push the limits of imagination. So, so like when you go to this museum, you can see that you see like uh, amazing pieces and you, by just, by just the, these two pictures you can see on the side, it's just like, it's just like very, very detailed, it's like to scale, it's, it's really amazing work. Uh, it's likely they have been interested to the museum because the vast amount of man hours involved make them priceless. So yes, it's, yeah, it's amazing I, work. I have to say uh, I went there like four times uh, since the, you know, the beginning of my tour de France and um, and uh, last year 
I went with uh, with uh, Lisa, uh, and I'm always like uh, amazed. Like it's it's just it's mind blowing like the, the the quality of work you can see there and the number of hours they spend to make to make this, those works. It's uh, it's if you have the opportunity to go to France, maybe not in the next few weeks or months. It's, it's happening, but uh, no, no, no. one day the opportunity to uh, to go there and to go to the to this city. Uh, uh, go to the to the museum. Uh, you have like a full um, history of the companion uh, uh, explained, or French, and um, yeah, you, you will see like really amazing, amazing things. And yeah, just the showpiece on the left was just made of sugar, so it just people can think it's made from wood. You know, yeah, it's yeah, sugar, yeah, it's yeah, actually like, sugar. Yeah. I thought it was made of wood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to start uh, just talking to you about uh, our masterpieces. So, that's you. That's you. So, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, our masterpieces are not appropriate to be in the museum. Uh, the first masterpiece work was eaten. Yes. Uh, because it's a uh, the pastry chef, so obviously, uh, might have been, yeah, I wish I would have yeah, been there yeah. for the rest. For the rest of us, the elders uh, decided our masterpiece would serve better as practical and working pieces in the company house. So, friends, so mainly, like, most, mostly, like, now, like, a lot of masterpieces are made to not all of them, but most of them are uh, made to improve our house uh, around friends. Uh, there's always something to. To, uh, to feed, there is always like new offices, uh, new windows, new doors, and uh, luckily we've got all these trays in the same place to make all the work. So why not? So we're gonna come to talk to you through what we find. All right. So <laughs> it's there already. It's there already. <laughs> Uh, so, so this this work is a uh, so it's an office fitting. So it was designed to uh, to be in, a, in an office uh, within the within the, the house I was living in. So it's uh, composed by uh, there are two elements. So a tall cupboard and a lower cupboard. Uh, the tall cupboard is made. Uh, it's composed of like a, just shelving inside and one curved door and one flat door. Uh, the, the second lower one is um, three three compartments, so one flat door and two curved door. Uh, it's all made out of uh, uh, veneer, so it's made out of uh, sycamore, maple sycamore and budenga. Um, and <laughs> so this is and that just these are some pictures of the of the process of how we make how we shape. Uh, the wood to, to, as, as per our, our plan. So these are actually like two jigs and, and some uh, plywood in the middle to, uh, to bend and to form uh, the shape of the doors in a, in a big press. So it's all different layers of plywood that are put together uh, to form the, the final shape. Uh, these pictures are uh, the, the jigs uh, I have to make to create the tall curved door. Uh, on the picture on the left, you can see like uh, the first part of the the cutouts for all the all the, the like the like, I call it the, the fault line design. Um, so yeah, it was pretty intense. Like a, it's like a big piece, and there's a lot of steps on this piece. So I think that is, that is interesting to show like how we actually make it. Uh, so on the picture on the left, you can see um, so that was the first uh, hand sketch uh, I used to create this uh, this fault line. So I I start with a uh, with a chalk and uh, use like a with a, a blue chalk pen to, to draw the, the final one, which I will put it on the on the final piece. So on the left hand, on the right hand side, sorry, is that uh, the talk about not unfinished uh, on the on the in the workshop. Almost ready to launch, and that's the second part. Uh, that's the lower part uh, of the of the job. 
So, it's still in progress, it's not, it's not finished yet. Uh, we still can see some, uh, uh, the, some tape on the doors, uh, some vertical lines, the white lines are actually like the, the, the tape that connects everything together, uh, that I haven't removed yet because it wasn't time to do it yet. Uh, so yeah, it's just like different steps and it's, uh, the first assembly of, uh, of this cabinet, uh, in the work. Uh, everything fits and all the curves, uh, match. Uh, uh, this job took me at, uh, around like uh, overall uh, about like 100 hours. How old you were when you were in the bed? How old? I was uh, 20, 28. 28 years old. Yeah, I started a bit late. Oh, yeah. yeah. You were old. Yeah, I was <laughs> old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my uh, work to uh, make a, a masterpiece. So it's um, it's actually the same companion house than uh, where Laurent did um, his. Uh, it's not far actually, far away from uh, from each other. Like the, the office are really not far from uh, from uh, where uh, mine is. So the the photo you can see it's before. So that's an old frame it, um, to understand like the um, the first companion houses. We are built around like 1960s, yeah, around the 60s. So uh, obviously, like uh, during the years, um, all the structures and uh, uh, need to be like uh, replaced and get old. Um, uh, so this steel frame there, uh, glass window, uh, well, the, the the paint was uh, cracked over the time, and uh, uh, you can see like the corner of the the frame where it started to uh, to rust. The glass it was like just like a single um, yeah. pan layer of glass. So even this wasn't compliant anymore. Is the standard the new standard with the revolution and all the um, uh, regulation? It was always cold. So, in yeah, it was always cold yeah. because uh, it's just like a single single uh, pan of glass so and it gets very cold in, the, in this area of France during winter very snowy as well so it was time to to replace it and that was the opportunity for me to do uh, to integrate my masterpiece work um, into uh, into the house and contribute as well to well to maintain the the um, the, the, the quality of life uh, in the house and the building itself. So this is the result. Um, it's uh, all uh, insulated glass, so double glazing. Uh, the frame is not steel anymore, but stainless steel, which will uh, avoid that uh, for the rusting or anything that way. Um, uh, it's all like uh, brushed, stainless steel brushed, and the technical part of it was the actually I, I made. My, I engineered my own profile uh, to make this uh, this window. Frame. And on the top of this, I added like a, a bit of a more decorative uh, touch to it, which is like all the um, lines, the curved lines you can see uh, that goes across the frame and the wall. Um, in between. Yeah. Um, I spent Overall, um, it was about 460 hours of work, um, including like the, the plans, the engineering of the profile, uh, the fabrication and installation. Yeah, about, about 460 hours. Okay. All right, this is my work. Um, all pictures, sorry, they're not digital this one. Um, yeah, so my work, so generally for baby chef, uh, the way it's work is, um, it's like if we receive, if we, it's like if we have the business and someone order, uh, order something. So my, my work was for the Bank de France. It's, it's a fake order, but it was for the Bank de France or, uh, um, the French, French bank to, um, a central bank. To, um, the idea was to get like 25 percent from the morning to the evening, so uh, to celebrate the passage from France, from France to Euro, oh. and so it was, it was the theme was uh, Euro at the time, and 
and uh, also so you had the, uh, to accommodate the person at the beginning when the, with the coffee so you have coffee and uh, and uh, demoiserie so croissant danishes uh, a brioche etc then after we move to um, uh, I think it's on the second slide with petit four for the for the buffet uh, and then I just have to do the dessert so you can see on on the door of the so I do the dessert and some plated. And then after we had like a afternoon trophy, so with the slide the picture on the right. So it was just like petit four uh, sec. Uh, so it's a different with macaron and stuff like this. Then after at the end we had, uh, had to do like the buffet. Uh, the, yeah, the buffet. Uh, we could see at the first slide. Sorry, we have to come back here. Yeah. So this one like was to accommodate a good forty-five person. Then the desserts uh, was like five different cake, has to do five different cake from uh, traditional cake to modern cakes. And then uh, for the evening, I had to do like a, sh uh, a bonbon um, presentation, so like with chocolate and nougat and more stuff like this, marshmallow, and uh, a pork en bouche. Uh, Finish as well. So, and every single staff has to be on a different uh, 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 present board, pretty much. So, it's why mm -hmm. I like stairs to present the bonbon, uh, a different shape, and um, the petit four for the aperitif uh, buffet uh, for the midday was uh, on like a book opening, and you, you got the guys from the Europe. Um, so on the second slide, you can <coughs> the top picture you can see just uh, the, the it was text like the, the idea was having a book with every page some uh, some petit course so it was some salty and, and uh, sweet ones and so you you pretty much touch all the aspects of the, the pastry uh, of the pastry job going from salty to sweet and uh, and that's yeah pretty much you have to do everything on your own you can have the help so like like Laurent, Thomas, and uh, uh, Anthony, and we can have the help from uh, youngest, but just for very simple uh, task. Uh, but everything has to be pretty much done by yourself. Uh, it's, it me, took me like five weeks to get everything ready. Of this, you can't do. Uh, it's a lot of tasks to be done at the last week for the future because we do the stuff. But like all the presentation board and stuff like this, that's done first, and then. Do all your artwork like chocolate and sugar work, second, etc. And then you finish with the last three or four days before you can sleep for two days to get everything ready. So, so it's five five weeks of uh, of uh, preparation, yeah. but like how long did that could take you to uh, to to make actually? Uh, in uh, total, in um, the, I think it was around like 500, uh, 500 hours. Yeah, okay. Because was like last five weeks, and, and and on the side we still work, we still work on the, on the company. So I took two weeks, the last two weeks I took them off. But yeah, it's pretty much all this from stay. Mm. All this to be done in two hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yes. <laughs> and yeah, it's all. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the yeah. best pastry chef. Uh, like marketing uh, <laughs> and, uh, ingredients, putting mm -hmm. everything right. Yeah. yeah, but I got to eat some stuff as well. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bargain. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so my masterpiece was um, when I did it. I was living in. Um, we had the chance to have a company quarter in a in a castle. Uh, in the middle of France, in a little city called Sepois. And um, there was a door on one of the side buildings of the castle that was basically completely damaged and needed to be redone. So that was my masterpiece. Um, so it's a door with like two different uh, design on each side. Um, on the picture of the left, obviously it's the outdoor um, it's the outdoor design which is um, so a glass on the top and on on the bottom it's like an, a panel assembled uh, with all traditional um, assembly in the corners uh, for 
um, quarter of circle pieces and a midwood assembly cross in the middle. Um, the four panels in the middle uh, are molded with a spinner molder and the four little white panels on the corners are exactly on the same level as the frame itself and which makes it trickier because there's no shadow line or any gap so it need to be basically perfect a perfect match between the the curved piece and the curved of the panel um my main piece was this bottom panel that you can see um, um on those three pictures on the slide um the two on the left are two different jigs made out of plywood that I used to carve and um, mold the piece, um, which is a different technique to what Loren used on his cupboard when he used uh, small pieces, really thin pieces of timber, which call laminates, glue them together together to, to give the shape to his cupboard. Those ones are mass, um, like timber, proper timber. So which require like a bigger piece of timber to be able to get the shape inside of one piece and then machine it um, in a spinner molder with jigs and different tools as well. Um, the last picture, the, the one on the right hand side that you can see um, is a picture that I took at a certain moment. So to realize a masterpiece um, as a joiner or cabinet maker, um, we need um, um, we need a piece that is basically we can't assemble, so we don't know if it's going to work or not, and that's the piece that we get judged on um, by our elders. So basically, on the right hand side, you can see all the tenants that are way longer than they should be, because I wasn't allowed to assemble that before the final. Um, decision basically final meeting with my elders and uh, on the day I had to cut them to the exact size and I didn't know if it was good or not and they just told me all right the the reception is going to be the ceremony is going to be a month later so for a month I, I didn't know if it was um, if the work I did was correct or not and I knew on the on the exact day of the ceremony one month later. So it was a stressful month, really stressful month. I think Laurent has been through that as well. <laughs> they like to, to they like to make it hard. Um, so as you can see on the picture before, the door is assembled and installed. So it obviously went well, <laughs> which I'm glad. <laughs> otherwise, I <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be um, at this webinar as a companion, maybe. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that was um, that was just a part of the of the work. So this this piece, this door, took me 160 hours, which is not a huge amount of work for a masterpiece. But um, however, um, I did before that, and which is not in the in the in the slides. But I I had to do before that um, a pre work, um, and the companions milder used this pre work to know if I was basically ready um, to do my masterpiece. And this pre work took me four hundred hours, so which brings the total uh, at five hundred and fifty hours. So it was really interesting. Really interesting. Basically, yes. Because um, uh, I wasn't up to five years exactly. I was up to three and a half, four years. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I was I was ready. That's it. Hey. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much. I'm back. I hear you go. I forgot to put my camera on. Um, thank you very much. There's been a few questions coming through, but I think as you talked, you answered most of them. So let's have a look at the ones where we didn't get the answers. Can anyone join a companion or is there an age limit? Um, 
there's a age limit based uh, simply on um, it's not a, a, a strictly age limit, but generally you need to be able to, to travel around. Uh, when you do your Tour de France, you need to travel around these uh, uh, headquarters. And yeah, you travel with people uh, between 15 to 25, 28 years old. So generally, to start the Tour de France doesn't start later than, I think the maximum I heard was 24. Yeah, 25 years 24 old. In my year. 24 years old is, is the latest we started for the first. Because after you, it's we consider it that you need to be more building a family, and it's a bit too late to, uh, to start. Mm. But there are exceptions. But there is exception okay. after different. Thank you. Yeah, which skills you're doing and, and what your training is mm. more. Well. But the the mainstream is like to start. Uh, <laughs> After um, high school, which is like uh, you're around like uh, yeah, 15, 16 years old, and um, and then like uh, you do your you start apprenticeship, yeah, you do your yeah. apprenticeship, your tour apprenticeship. De France, and when you do your tour de France, so you move from one headquarter to another. It's why we are here, and you you see progress on the side. Okay. Sounds great. So that means, Sebastian, I know who you are. So that means too late for you. <laughs> um, we have another question from Sally. She said, um, there are still people doing many lost trades, but I guess they can't join the companions of duty. It's not that they can't. They probably have not. But yes, there are still a lot of lost trades happening. Or how do you see that in Australia and France? You, you talked about a lot of jobs, but yes, there are a lot of jobs disappearing in the artisan so, world, I suppose. Well, it's just that um, there's like the trades today that are um, related to those lost trades. So it's just like learning uh, joinery, for example. If someone later on wants to specialize in, um, um, what was it, like we'll, we'll write, uh, because there is a niche and or I don't know, just to bring back this, this profession, this part of the, this part of passion or something like this. Mm -hmm. like, by learning like uh, joinery, like uh, you can maybe go sideways and um, learn by yourself or find people who have still knowledge to, to work in this way. Um, an example is like uh, everyone knows that like, there is like uh, knife makers, for example, everywhere around the world. And I know some com companions that are knife makers now, like they, they specialize in this, this type of trade, which is not offered by the companions, but like through learning blacksmithing or uh, metalworking, you can, after it's a personal choice, uh, some became uh, uh, knife makers and famous knife makers as well. Uh, they are recognized like in the, uh, all around the world for their, for their work. It's, uh, it's, ma it's, it's masterpieces what they are doing now. So it's, very, it's a niche again. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, what we call lost trade is just that, uh, that there is not enough, the, the, the courses are not anymore on offer with the, the companions because, uh, as we said before, it's, uh, it's a niche. And so there, there won't be any uh, like opportunities, like uh, there won't be enough work to create like, a course, uh, create uh, uh, Specific course with apprentices for this because uh, even to find a job with this industry would be uh, quite complicated. Uh, so it's not lost completely. People still have the knowledge, it's probably just not on offer with the, with the company. But some people okay. still have the knowledge of all this way. Um, I know in France you have a huge reputation based on hundreds of years of history. Um, do you think this companionage gets any recognition at all in Australia? Does it help you with your work? Um, well, generally, you don't put it up front as well. Uh, people don't understand what it is, so they get confused. Although, I don't think when you get there, people get confused after. It's just when they when they see your work, they, they understand that, yeah, you get, you get some... Uh, um, by the way you work, by the quality of your work going out, they, yeah, they, they can see that yeah, you come from a good school, but after they don't, don't understand what exactly your companion are. 
Okay, so that doesn't guarantee you any uh, jobs on any particular buildings. Like, um, is one of you working on the lighthouse at the moment? Where have I read that? Someone, you yeah, have some uh, some state cabinet around the lighthouse. We consider the heritage building. Uh, I was working in France. Uh, I was foreman in uh, Notre Dame de Paris as well uh, for for the, for almost a year. Uh, to like when I was like 29, 28, 29, at the end of my career. We are we are both to, to work on some some nice jobs to work in the company that works within this uh, work on this monument so we can work on it. Okay. Um do you know how many companions would be in Australia? Do you keep in touch with each other? Do you talk to each other or not at all? There are two who are living in Australia and there are two like uh, as you said like we are the, the two companies are based on traveling, so a lot of uh, young people on their travel France are also like traveling to Australia for for a year. Uh, and some, some are living uh, in Australia. Yeah, uh, I know a few in Melbourne because I was living in Melbourne at some point, so I know two other cabinet makers, uh, Rupert. Uh, yes, two other pastry chef. Is another pastry chef that didn't finish his travel France, but still, did, is still, yeah, we still recognize him as part of that. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a fair in um, where is it? Uh, in New South Wales. Yeah, it wasn't seen there before, but now it's in uh, uh, Port Macquarie. Um, yeah, mm. we have a mason, way. mason yeah. landscaper here living, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, in Potsdam, yeah. uh, yeah. not far from here, from the Byron Shire. He's, a, he's not a companion, he's an aspirant, but uh, okay. for personal reasons, he had to. Uh, leave the companion before to be able to do his, uh, his masterpiece and yeah. um, and he came to Australia and um, yeah find, find his wife here and now he, he has yeah. like um, uh, two kids and he's here for like uh, eight or ten years now so yeah, and we, we met him on the job yeah we we're working on the same job so sometimes it's just like a the pure coincidence we just start talking oh you're fine uh, yeah you okay Okay, well, that sounds really good. I've got uh, a few more questions before you go. Yes, um, yes. Are your clients mainly private or government? Sorry? Your clients, are they mainly yeah. private or government? Oh, private, yeah. They were private. But yeah. that's, like that's more based on the company we're working in. Yeah. Yeah. Are you working with a company, Anthony? Yeah, I think that's more based on the, that that is really separate from companions because we're not like a company as companions, but it's more based on the company we're working for. Mm. Does that make sense? Like if we work for a company that does private job or a company that does government jobs, basically, mm. which is two different types of companies, but it's yeah. possible to work in both. Yeah. Well, maybe most uh, companies are working for private clients. Mm. That would be the main the main. The main thing you would have done here. Okay. Um, uh, we have Norel who says, I could recommend a fantastic book about stone masons who travel to Paris. So that's more for the attendees. It's called The Journey of Martin Nadeau, A Life in Turbulent Times by Gillian Tindall. And another question from Sebastian. Uh, thank you for the answer. All this creative work would require lots of expensive equipment. How many workshops do you have in Australia? So that's probably for Malam Joinery, that one. Right. You have one so, workshop in Baron? So as as company, so we are we are a company, uh, uh, Malam Joinery, but uh, uh, we are companions within uh, within a company we created. So we work for ourselves, we create something. So it has nothing. The company has nothing to do with uh, uh, with the companions. Uh, uh, and we have one workshop. We have one workshop and they will fully equipped uh, in the northern yeah. region. We'll come and do a factory tour, uh, workshop tour one day. <laughs> uh, question for you, Bertrand. Um, yes. I've seen uh, on our page of the website you created a company called Holy Nuts. Yes. What happens to your pastry skills now? Uh, I still use them because uh, I create my own business through. Uh, 
to accommodate my family uh, life and as well because I found out that I'm being intolerant to gluten so yes being pastry chef working in uh, business is a bit hard to find business that's completely gluten free because uh, I'm quite strongly intolerant and uh, and yes yeah, so, uh, I found out that was easier for me to create my own, my own business and now I'm doing as well market stalls where I can use my skills doing cakes with the products uh, I'm selling online uh, so um, yeah I'm still using them for this every day sounds really good i'm just putting on the right hand side the dates of the next french festival because maybe if you do market stores you should come and um bring your products to brisbane <laughs> so the festival is not happening next week as it should have been with the COVID situation but we will run the french festival in october in brisbane okay. so hopefully we will be able to invite you all because i think uh, meeting the people and bringing a couple of pieces that you've worked on will make a big difference. And we have 100 people registered for that webinar. But being a Sunday, I think we don't have a lot of live audience, but I'm sure they would have lots and lots of questions for you. So maybe if we're lucky, you can come in October and we can ask you more questions then. Sure. Yeah, you can take your cakes at the same time. Yeah, really <laughs> I ate them all, but no more. That's it. Yeah. Yes. One for this time, one for tomorrow. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Anthony, I'm not sure about you because you're locked in Melbourne, so bad luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> okay, thank you very no, much. Uh, situation, situation is not that bad. We just uh, got the uh, compulsory uh, mask for um, from Thursday morning. Yeah. We'll all have. To wear a mask in Victoria. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe yeah. move up to stage four if, if things not going any better. No, it's a very sad situation, and I hope we'll be able to do our event in October because we all want to go back to our normal jobs and normal life. So yeah, see what happens. But thank you very much, especially on a Sunday, to take time to talk to us. Um, that was the best way to close our cultural webinars. I think. Uh, it was very interesting and uh, it only happens in France, that type of thing. So it's worth sharing because people don't know enough about it. Merci. C'était super. Thank you. À bientôt. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you very soon. Thank you, Lisa. We can't see Lisa, but she did all the technical work. So she's behind the computer and it's all good. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Time to go back to the beach now. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.